<laughs> All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Atticus Live, where we drink beer and All talk right. about boats. And uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, why we dragged anchor in last week's episode and exactly what we learned from that experience. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Stick around. <laughs> Okay, what's up guys? I'm Jordan. And I'm Desiree. And uh, we've been working on boats for a long time, but we are newbie cruisers. So definitely take everything that we have to say with a grain of salt. So today we're super excited to have collaborated with a handful of sailing channels. We've got... Da, 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 Trio Travels, Ingaro, Sailing Uma, White Spot Pirates, Venture Lives, MJ Sailing, and Follow the Boat. Um, beyond that, we also have Mantis Marine and Fortress Marine Anchors on the line. I uh, just watched the internship on the line. <laughs> tonight to answer any super technical questions you guys have or we have about anchoring. So let's take full advantage of them. Yeah, Colin's in the house. What's up? Bake sale. What's going hey, on? Hey, Colin. Dave. So As glad always. to have you, buddy. Yeah. And also, speaking of, uh, tonight Dave is going to be our moderator. So he's going to be helping us, helping us out with shout outs and filtering in good questions. Um, so thank you so much, Dave. As always, you're doing an amazing job. We love you. Um, if you're at all interested in becoming a moderator for our future live streams, uh, just send me a message on our Facebook page and we will make you an honorary patron. So uh, that means you get to come hang out with us online in our Facebook uh, patron hangout, hangout group where we kind of uh, interact on a more personal level. We do polls, contests, and kind of patron-only live streams about our daily lives and day-to-day -day decisions. So uh, yeah. And as we go through our topics today, feel free to just comment, ask questions. We're going to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, so yeah, Jordan's going to start off by talking about why we decided to um, dive into anchoring today. Um, well, and first of all, Tom McFarlane, what's up, buddy? And everybody else joining us today, how are you today? Um, show me where we are real quick, sorry. Experience? Um, oh, okay. So uh, the, the actual, the, the hat that I'm wearing right now comes from Second Star, our neighbor and the uh, boat and the couple that we've worked with for this entire year since we've been in Issa Harris. Hey, Venture Lives! What's hey, up, guys? guys? Awesome. Um, and Anne. Hey, but, uh, hey, Anne. Anne as well. <laughs> um, but anyway, the guy from Second Star, our neighbor, has this really great phrase they like to say a lot, which is, experience is the thing that you get just after you need it. And I think that's like the most appropriate, like perfect uh, phrase, especially for cruising. Because I feel like cruising is just one like, like moment like that after another where like something goes down, things get kind of weird, you <laughs> learn from it, and then you try to tell other people about it, you know? And so we're going to try and focus on doing that today, Ex you know, kind of expressing uh, something that you know we did wrong and experience that we went through so hopefully you guys don't have to go through it um, so first topic today is everyone drags okay so uh, now that we can get that out of the way um, so a lot of people we've been getting a lot of comments on that last episode specifically talking about like you know implying or assuming that if you drag at anchor that you don't have the proper equipment you're you don't have enough of that equipment you're you're somehow doing something wrong with your anchoring uh, system choices and we in our experience our experience talking to other cruisers who have been doing this way longer than us that doesn't seem to be true at all now, obviously, sometimes when people drag anchor, it is because of poor equipment choices, but that's not always true. It seems as though dragging anchor is something that is always a possibility, no matter how well you have designed your anchoring system. Otherwise, there wouldn't be live streams about anchoring. Everyone would have the same anchor and techniques and anchor setup, and no one would be dragging. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, um, and the other thing, it, well, yeah, so let's just dive right into it. So our first guest appearance today uh, was a written response from uh, Follow the Boat, Jamie on Follow the Boat. So he's going to tell you a little bit about an experience that they had. I'll just read it out loud for you. 
Um, he says, if anybody tells you that they never drag, they're either lying or haven't done much anchoring. It's part of the learning process. We have a lot of experience of other boats dragging, but the best story is when it happened to me. Liz had returned to the UK to see her family, so I decided it would be a good idea for me to go off solo sailing around the Greek islands armed with our new Rockna, which had just hit the market. On the first night of my solo adventure, I dropped the hook in what I later learned was a no-go anchorage due to the weed on the seabed. At 2 a.m., I was roused from my slumber to shouting and grinding. When I eventually got my shit together, I was horrified to find a charter boat alongside Esper with three crew running around their deck. What are you doing coming alongside me at this time of night, I asked. They explained quite calmly that I had dragged and that I'd hit their bow with my <laughs> solar panel array, smashing one of the panels. Turns out they were on a mooring and I'd dragged over 100 meters across the bay. Had I not have hit them, I'd have run aground. I remember thinking, this solo sailing lark isn't for me. I should return to the marina and wait for Liz to come back. But I knew that we that would be my, me defeated. It took a lot of balls to continue on my journey, but I did. I learned very quickly how to choose your anchorage and how to set the anchor pro properly. I never did replace that panel. It's still smashed and it's still working. <laughs> I love that. That's so awesome. So thanks a lot, follow the vote. That was a really great anecdote. Um, Rob S is in the house. Hey, What's Rob up, boys? And I think that's important to realize. Like, don't get down on yourself. Like, some people assume you have to know exactly how to sail and exactly how to cruise before getting into cruising, but that's unrealistic because you have to start somewhere. Yeah. So as long as you're being smart, doing your research, and really trying and being adaptive to the circumstances, then like, how can you do better? You know. So. Yeah. Okay, so the next uh, response that we got is from Sailing Zingaro, my boy James over there. Um, and Kimmy. <laughs> and Kimmy. Sorry, don't want to leave out Kimmy. So, uh, guys, let me know if, if you're not hearing any of this audio, please let me know. So, here we go. Good morning, people. This is Sailing Zingaro. Uh, we were to talk about uh, if we have a drug or a dragging experience because Dragging is a normal part of being a boater that is actually anchoring and not only chilling in different marinas and do like some I, kind of marina hopping. I've never drunk. And they were all her fault. <laughs> so the last time, for example, we drug was a nightmare. Not only it's not a big deal, you know, you drag a little and there's nothing happens, nobody's around you and you're setting the anchor again, but last time was crazy. Yeah, we tried to reset the anchor after we drugged and then the dinghy painter, because it's all going from zero to a hundred, yeah? You're suddenly <laughs> dragging and before that we had dinner and we had fun. That sucks, this is a nightmare. I want to have an apartment f boats. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we're good now. But I don't think I put enough road out, but I, I put like eight to one scope out, but every once in a while that mantis just drags. But you know what's cool is if that mantis drags, that Danforth always catches. <laughs> always have two, things, always have two different ones. So, no, we were pressure. asleep. We were asleep. Yeah, but it was yeah, like two o'clock in the morning. Whatever, it goes from nothing to craziness. So we feel the boat dragging, and and we go, oh, okay, we're cool. We're, we haven't drugged very far. We're just gonna pick up the anchor and reset it because we're a little close to this boat behind us. So we, we start <laughs> motoring up to the anchor and the damn dinghy painter gets caught in the prop on the, on the starboard side. So now it's, it's way in there too. And we're right next to another boat. My anchor's got not enough scope out. It's, it's blowing like hell and my dinghy has been pulled under the boat by the prop and it's sinking. <laughs> and I have to get in the water. It's like two o'clock in the morning. It came out of nowhere. It's yeah. always like that. It's always like that. So. Yeah, always have a second anchor ready. That's that's safety because dragging the wind shifts and it just pulls you out. It just happens. Always dive your anchor. That's what I learned. Actually, I learned that from Riley on his little ebook that he when he first got started he put put out this little ebook. Who's Riley? Riley and Elena from uh, Sailing Love Vagabond. Yeah. Yeah. Don't feel so bad, guys. It's all right. It happens. Uh, it's all right. It happens to everybody. <laughs> I'm glad it there was. To the best. I'm glad there was people there to help you out. We would do the same thing and hope that someone else would do that for us too. Actually, they have. I have. I've done that same damn thing. I've drugged when I went spearfishing at night, 
and somebody else grabbed my boat and tied it to another boat. I came back and it was tied to another boat. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah, I forgot about that. So yeah, all you YouTubes don't get on anybody else's ass for dragging. Yeah, don't be so melodramatic. Nobody's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> right. Peace out, guys. I don't really think this is going to help them, you know? <laughs> Everybody's just going to be like, oh, don't get any advice from those dopers. They don't know what you're doing. They're high all the time. Woo. I don't even Jamaica. smoke. I don't even smoke pot. One time I said I wanted to smoke pot on, in Jamaica, and they were like, now I'm a stoner. <laughs> it's funny, man. It's just like eating steak in Argentina. You kind of have to, yeah? yeah? One last thing before we go. Desiree and Jordan, we miss you and love you. Oh, love those guys. Yeah, so Dude. awesome. <laughs> All right, James and Kimmy, we love you guys too. Uh, I, I think those guys are rock stars, man. Like Jim, Jim Morrison had nothing on James. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention again, guys, today we do have Mantis Marine Anchors and Fortress uh, Marine Anchors on, on the line. I can't stop saying that. So uh, if you have any technical questions, feel free to ask them. And in fact, you can just address your question, just say Mantis, and then ask a question. Yeah, and then we can read it out loud for everyone's benefit. And But they will answer your questions directly. Yeah, and so Venture Live says, uh, an anchor alarm is very beneficial. It will get you up before you drag a thousand feet. That is true. That is a great thing to have. Someone else mentioned um, insurance, and that was a question that we got in one of our previous live streams. Um, we personally don't have boat insurance on Atticus. Uh, we figured we'll just pay for all the damages and uh, that would probably outweigh the cost in the end if something catastrophic did happen to Atticus. So moving on, let's go on to, yeah, so essentially what we learned from dragging was that um, not necessarily how to never drag, um, but how to mitigate the risk and result of dragging through equipment choices and technique. So Jordan's going to go over kind of what we what equipment we were using when we dragged and what techniques we used. Um, yeah, go ahead. Boom. Oh, boom. Equipment and technique when we dragged. Okay, so um, long story short, I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but we just had a lot of questions about how much chain, what kind of chain, blah, blah, blah did we have when, when we dragged. So first of all, we had we had a 10 to 1 scope at the time, which is excessive. Like, I'll just start by saying that. And to be honest, and this is going to be one of the lessons that we learned, but excessive is a good thing from time to time. So 10 to 1 scope, um, we had an all chain road. <clears throat> now that chain road is a high test uh, chain, so it's a little bit lighter than normal proof coil or triple B. Um, it's a, we were able to get away with quarter inch uh, high test chain, seeing as how Atticus is only 30 feet and, and 12,000 pounds. Um, now, uh, uh, beyond that, we had a snubber. We did have a snubber on, a lot of people were asking about that. And then the anchor that we were using was a uh, Manson Supreme, the 25 pound anchor. Um, some of you guys are going to say, oh, that's a little bit light. Uh, that's probably true, and we'll get into that here in a moment. Um, but I, before, we, before we do, just to make sure you guys know, that is the anchor that Manson recommends for a boat of 35 feet in length. But we're going to talk about that more here in a second as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, so that, oh, we did power set the anchor, um, and uh, we, we generally... Uh, come back against it at about uh, 1800 RPMs um, and then we did dive on it uh, and it had you know taken well it was it, it had dug in pretty well. And I do want to answer a very important question. Yes. Ken Royal just says is that Merlot and this is actually Malbec. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> and then Brian Sheehan is saying Fortress is here so rock on. Oh hey Brian. Looks like Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us Brian. We really appreciate yeah, it. Awesome. Um, so guys if you have any questions about really lightweight innovative anchoring solutions you can ask Brian. Um, okay so uh, what else do I want to talk about here? Um, I want to talk about th there's in my opinion there's two ways that we could have dragged or better there's two ways that our anchor could have failed. One being that as the front came through and the wind clocked in from the south to the northwest, um, the, the possibilities are that A, 
we swung as the wind direction changed and the anchor did not swing and readjust with us and if it did not then what happened was you know we we held to the anchor all night and all morning with those real choppy windy conditions and so the cha the odds are you know the possibility is that the anchor did not reset and eventually the shank got pulled and, and blah 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 you know the rest is history or the anchor did have a chance to readjust which is what I think happened because we were experiencing those same conditions for at least 12 hours. Um, so I imagine it probably did reset and then literally just kind of came out and pulled a chunk of the bottom with it. Uh, when we finally did get the anchor back on the boat, it literally was a ball of mud. Um, and the bottom in Isla Mujeres is so soft, it's like a silt but yet it's got just enough vegetation so that that soft mud doesn't break away once the anchor breaks away. So it just, that the roots from that vegetation were just uh, prevalent enough to sort of maintain this nasty ball of gunk around the anchor. Um, so that's just generally what happened, you know, the two possibilities of what happened when we, when we did uh, start to drag. So let's hop into lessons we learned from that experience. Um, I would say to start off with, um, things we wouldn't change are essentially everything we did right. So we wouldn't change our skate, our chain, our scope, the fact that we had a snubber, power setting the anchor, or diving on the anchor. Um, what we would do differently potentially is think about potential equipment solutions. Uh, so Jordan's going to talk about um, the idea of oversizing your primary anchor. Yes. So, yes, this is going to be one of the major lessons that we walked away from this experience with is oversizing your anchor. And um, I know uh, uh, Venture Lives is here. I hope they're still here with us, but we're going to show a video of theirs in a little bit, and they talk about this as well. Um, but first, before we go into that, I, we thought it was great. We had a comment on Facebook that specifically asked about this. So uh, Jason Bowles says, how big is too big or is there diminishing returns from increased size regarding anchors? I've seen the recommendations for going one size larger than required. I've also seen Uma ride out a hurricane on their monster anchor um, and that was a mantis. I want to size my anchor conservatively, but is there a point where it's non-beneficial or potentially detrimental to use a larger anchor? Um, so very, uh, very good question. Um, and real quick, Jane has a really good question. Do you want to address that first? Or? Sure. Uh, Jane, Jane Wiseman, who we have a surprise for you, Jane. We're, we're going to mention you specifically here in a little while, so I hope that stick you around. stick around. But Jane says, novice here, can you explain how you know when your anchor is seated? Well, I mean, the best way to know, Jane, is to dive on it. And I don't have any images that I can show you now, but the difference between, if you're physically looking at an anchor on the bottom, the difference between a properly dug in anchor and an anchor that um, isn't actually like, because the problem is a lot of times, especially if you're using an all chain road, that chain, if it's all laying on the bottom, will create enough drag so that you're not actually engaging the anchor a lot of the time. Or the anchor can barely be caught on like, you know, a weed or a rock or something and not actually digging in. So the, the, the visuals of what it looks like could are very obvious. Um, diving on the anchor is by far and away the best way of knowing that. Um, and uh, while I'm talking, if you can keep an eye on the comments, let, keep letting sure, me know absolutely. if you see anything. Yeah. Um, so anyway, oversizing the anchor, um, it, again, is the biggest thing that we came away from. The, what I want to talk about first, though, is sizing charts. Um, now, we did a lot of research when we were in the preliminary stages of getting ready to, to start cruising. Um, and when we got our Manson Supreme, um, we actually got it, you know, secondhand from a friend. So, it, you know, he had it for sale. I researched it. I said, great, Manson, you know, this seems like a good anchor to go with. I looked at their website and checked out their sizing chart to make sure that the size of the anchor was appropriate for our boat. And Manson had a very simple sizing chart that specifically said, and the anchor that my friend was selling was the 25 pound uh, Manson. Looked it up, 
and lo and behold, the 25 pound Manson is recommended for 30 foot boats on the chart. Boom, there you go. I thought that was just, that was all I needed to worry about. Manson, the company, recommended this uh, anchor for my boat. What I've learned and what we've learned from the experience we've had cruising is as, uh, at, oh, can you fix that? I'm sorry. I actually was gonna ask you how to fix that. I just oh. did something random. Okay, sorry. Um, but as our you know commenter was saying, as Jason was, was saying, like he's heard that you should get several sizes uh, higher. You should get an oversized anchor, right? Well, oversized is relative. This is why we're glad to have a Mantis representative here today. We are upgrading our anchor to a quote-unquote oversized Mantis. Um, but if you go to Mantis's website and look at their sizing chart, they've got a much more in-depth chart. They're going to break down the appropriate size anchor for your boat by three different categories. They've got you know sort of like a just a day sailor like day anchor. They've got the cruising anchor and then storm anchor. So already looking at a chart like that gives you a whole lot more information. And to be honest, if you compare it to the Manson chart, their entire chart is the day anchor, right? So they've their suggestions are based on like if you're just going out for you know the afternoon. You know what I mean? What kind of anchor you're going to want? They're not focusing on cruising. Cruising, and that's something in general that I think it's good as a cruiser or a potential cruiser to start to understand is that most uh, manufacturers, you are if you're a cruiser, you are not their primary target generally. You know what I mean? The people that live on their boat day in day out at anchor, actually moving around, actually going to places they're not familiar with, that's a fraction of most boating markets. Mm -hmm. So you got to assume that that they're not actually referring to that sort of Yeah, lifestyle. and I'll just chime in and say like that's true across the board with all the equipment you get on your boat. So like for our sewing equipment and for like sewing installations I've done um, on Atticus, I realized the how-to videos that Sailrite has are amazing, and I learned how to sew using just those videos. Um, but then once I started doing my own assemblies, I realized, oh, this is for like day sailing. I need to really amp it up, get the chafe gear going, do like double or triple reinforcements. Um, so yeah, if you're getting into cruising, even if you're going to a marine website, um, there is a distinct distinction between marine products and marine cruising products and options. So think about that if you're getting into cruising. Yep, absolutely. Um, question uh, Warp21 asks is, did you set the anchor at short scope first? Yes, I didn't I didn't mention that. Yeah, we, we generally set the anchor at about a four to one. Um, and for anybody that's not familiar with what that means, um, what I was saying before about how you could it's possible to not actually dig the anchor in due to the chain itself and all of that friction it creates laying on the bottom. Um, the, the, something that is advisable is to power set the anchor with a relatively short scope. So something like three to one or four to one. Um, at the very least, if not power set, at least um, like just stop letting out chain and let the boat sort of naturally tug on it just so that you straighten out that that chain and then also start to di you know guarantee that you're beginning to uh, put a load on the anchor itself rather than just just the chain rope. And uh, Tim23832 asks a really good question which is uh, I think something you should talk about which yeah. is I have a Cal 39 and just bought a 45 pound Manson Supreme Anchor how much uh, chain minimum do I need for East Coast, USA, and Caribbean? No windless yet. And this kind of goes into the idea of like, the idea of how much how much weight you should have on your bow and what are the compromises associated with oversizing your anchor and oversizing your chain. Yeah, I mean, your, your chain is gonna add a whole lot more weight than anchor, right? Like, um, I'll just tell you what we have. So again, we compromise with the weight of our chain, and we should probably talk about this real briefly and get back onto the main topic, but um, we compromise with the weight of our chain by doing high test. So high test gives you the ability to have the same working load as a heavier chain, um, but reducing the weight of the chain. Now a lot of people, oh, who, uh, 
Oops, wrong we're one. We're like so behind on comments. Yeah, Sorry, Tom. Man. Dude, Tom. Uh, Tom, thanks, you're the man. Tom. You're Sorry the we man. missed you or you just missed beautiful Jordan. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but but so uh, we have 300 feet of chain. That's, you know, gosh, boy, that's such a tough question to ask, man. Like, I Let's would ask Mantis. I, Mantis, that, everybody out there, what do you guys think? I know for the Caribbean, you definitely don't need 300 feet of chain. You just don't have all that many deep, steep two soundings. Um, I know our friends Venture Lives, you know, they're up in Alaska and that comes in handy for them a lot. If you're going to be in the Pacific, same thing. Um, I don't know about the East Coast. So that's something that is very going to be very dependent on East Coast. But if just Caribbean, you're not going to need a terrible amount of chain um, because there's just not that many spots that are super steep too. But then again, you've got some islands like Saba you know, in the Lesser Antilles, it can be pretty steep too. So this is a super complicated topic. <laughs> um, one that like, again, like putting weight in your bow, there's consequences to that. Like you, you can't just like put the ideal amount of equipment forward on your boat because you're gonna have issues uh, when you're actually in a seaway at that point. So yeah, and if um, Martin and Brian could comment on that as experts like that would be awesome to yeah. hear from us for other cruisers out there. Yeah, so uh, But really great question. I want to give a quick shout out to Project Manania. I don't know if I'm saying it right um, But they're doing awesome work uh, on their boat research um, Wise and uh, you guys are awesome. So thanks for joining us tonight. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, Venture Lives' story about well, anchoring. Oh. I did want to just finish up on the oversizing issue, yeah. though. Um, so, again, oversizing your anchor, that the phrase oversizing, again, is relative to what you're supposed to have, right? Um, if you look at a more well-put-together anchoring system or anchor sizing chart that, that takes into account the types of situations that you expect to be in, then you don't need to worry so much about oversizing. Now, we just spoke with Greg this morning, Greg from Mantis Anchor, about this exact issue. Um, they, you know, On their website, they suggest for a boat of our size, the, the 25 pounder for day sailing, 35 pounder for cruising day in, day out, winds under 50 knots, and then the 45 pounder for their storm anchor or winds over 50 knots. Now, I wanted to know, I asked Greg, hey, what do you think of getting the storm anchor size for your day in, day out anchor? And he said, in situations just like ours that we had here in Isla Mujeres, what can happen is you get into an anchorage and you can get that soft like silt bottom. And that's the killer is this like silty soft mush, right? But the problem is, is that you'll have one area, like small little patch that's like a denser mud, and then one little patch that's like a really soft mud. It's not, it's not uniform. And you can't control which type of mud you're getting into. So what he's saying there is, if you can carry the larger anchor, there's no reason not to. A aside from the weight on the bow, which is going to have effects on the boat's motion, when underway, but he's saying, you know, it it will benefit you to have the larger, even just like the larger surface area that it can it can literally grab more of that soft silt. So he did recommend if you can fit it, get the bigger anchor, and that's what we're going with. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna do the forty-five pound uh, Mantis anchor. That's right. There we go. Um, uh, real quick, uh, Brian from Fortress says Fortress recommends using six feet of chain for every twenty-five feet of water. And since mm. most coastal anchoring is done under 50 feet of water, boaters commonly use 10 to 15 feet of chain with our anchors. So yeah. that is awesome information. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. And, and now this is a question I'll put out to the community here is, um, if you are intending on doing a all chain road, um, what would you recommend the length be for that road if you're gonna be cruising in the US East Coast and the Caribbean? Also, thank you so much, Mark Bowers. Just give us a donation on Super Chat. You're awesome. Uh, thank you so much. All right, so let's go on to Venture Lives' story about anchoring and kind of getting into it, learning how to become experts at anchoring. Yeah, and this, uh, yeah, this is a great little uh, anecdote, so enjoy, guys. Hey, guys, it's Megan and Rob, and we are from Venture Lives. 
Yeah, we've been uh, sailing up in the Inside Passage of Alaska for the last three years. And I'm just going to start out by saying it probably took us about a good two years to get really comfortable with our anchoring system. And leaving the boat when it's on anchor. And let me also point out, up in Alaska, you're dealing with um, sometimes up to 25-foot tidal mm -hmm. shifts. On average, so, 16 to 20. It gets ripping yeah. in some of those areas, and you have no room for play, and it's every six hours that it's switching. Mm -hmm. um, one story we're going to talk about is when we decided to anchor off the bow in the stern. We'll never do that again. Let's put it that way. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is, especially in Alaska, the wind shifts a lot, mm -hmm. and so you have the tides and the winds shifting. And we were anchored in kind of this tight spot. We anchored off the bow in the stern. And in the middle of the night, um, one of the anchor alarms went off. Mm -hmm. We, I'm glad we had that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Yeah, the wind <clears throat> shift and then the, uh, the waves just started funneling in right where we were at inside the, the cove. Mm -hmm. And it just started coming up. The, the waves just like three foot just chop. So they're launching us. Yeah, and so, but it was coming from our side, from the, our beam. The wind the, and the The wind waves. and the wave are coming right from the beam. It was kind of lifting up the yeah. front end and pushing the, oops, sorry, <laughs> and pushing the boat essentially sideways. So if this is the boat, yep. we're anchored here and here, and we're being drugged like this. Boom. So Rob goes and he tries to pull up what, one of the anchors yeah, and was, none of them will budge because they have all of this tension coming this but we way. are sliding too so we're, and we're slowly dragging, dragging into shore, shore and we're just watching ourselves get closer and closer <laughs> and the depth alarm gets yeah. smaller and smaller and we're like what are we going to so, do it's 2 a.m yeah and rob's like i'm just gonna cut it we're gonna lose our anchor i was like no because it was tight like anchor. it was very tight that rope uh -huh. <laughs> and so uh luckily we had a uh, uh, a gallon milk jug yeah like a buoy and i was like no we're gonna tie the end of it <laughs> tie it to a buoy and we'll get it in the morning yeah so we just so we that. just left our anchor there tied to a buoy mm -hmm. um which was good we didn't lose our anchor and yep. then we got to but to right it. when we let go of that anchor we had to i had to run up to the bow while megan was going full throttle on the uh the the engine there and i had to pull up the anchor as fast as possible because yeah if we would have swung around, we would have swung into the shoreline because the coves are very deep. Like they're all carved out by glaciers over there. Yeah. So it'll be like 50 feet in one spot. But if you move over about a hundred feet, it's going to shelf right up to like essentially two feet and you'll be on ground. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. And there's rocks everywhere. Yeah. And yeah, so we had to do that, pull it up. And after that scenario, yeah. we realized we had to fix our anchor system. We decided to just go with one big solid storm anchor. Yes. And we got a Mantis anchor, has the roll bar. <laughs> so I guess in the case of Dragon Anchor, everyone's going to do it, but the best best way to go about it is just have one big solid anchor. Yes. Yep, that way you just you set it and forget it. Hope that helps you guys out. Yep. Cheers. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you so First of all, we want to say Venture Lives, you guys rock. We love their style. Like, they're very, very, like, uh, uh, wonderful photographers, and they're in a beautiful part of the world. So we highly recommend that you guys check out their channel. Um, and, uh, yeah, just that takeaway message of, like, really two things, right? One, dragging is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then two, bigger anchors is a wonderful solution to the problem. Now... Uh, ben Benedict Chin made a really great comment. He's saying that, uh, quoting Fatty Goodlander, who I love, so nice quote, says, if you can't carry the anchor, the boat is too big for you. Now, I don't want to stand by that wholeheartedly because for some people, larger boats are a good option, but it's something to consider, right, when choosing the size of your boat. If you can physically carry this your anchor, with your own hands across a deck or whatever, that's going to be a whole lot easier on you in the long run than if you're 100% um, uh, relying on mechanical advantage. So, All right, so um, speaking of Ben, are you okay if we head into... Well, I was just going to say one last thing before we get into this, guys. 
Uh, there's a lot of comments today. We're loving the interaction. I really want to encourage you guys out there. If you see someone asking a question that you've got a good answer to, we would really love it if you would just kind of address that question and answer. I mean, that would be great. We That's exactly what we would want this to be as a discussion. And if we're not addressing your question, go ahead and just say it again because there, it's kind of hard to keep in, keep track of all of it. Um, so we're not trying to ignore you. We're just, it's hard to keep track of it. Yeah. All right, so let's briefly go into uh, Atticus Chubbs real quick. Uh, Atticus Chubbs! All right, so you've got the comment of the week goes to Jane Wiseman. Which is um, here. And she says, yikes, so glad it was relatively good outcome. Also, how cool was the shot of sewing on the dock? Wishing you good wins and lots of high paying, easy jobs. And I feel like that should be added to every like fair wins and following C's quote because like that's what we're really interested in. That's great. Wishing so. you good wins and lots of high paying, <laughs> yeah. easy jobs. Yeah, that, Love it. that'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, and Jane. Chick and Patty Fries. Thank you for, oh, for the thank tip. You. We awesome. appreciate it. But anyway, cool. here's to Jane and to Chick and Patty yeah, everyone Fries. Everyone, take a drink. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Atticus Chug number two goes to our new patrons. We've got Brent Kenny, Mark Olson, David Rupp, and John Mansell. And John Mansell is a really good old friend of mine, so thanks, John. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, guys. So here's to Chug you guys. number two. Okay. All right, Chug number three goes to our donations from last week. We've got Ben Chin, who just had a great point. He's signing in from Singapore. And Terrell Boykin, who we actually just had... Uh, grapefruit juice and a coffee with today. He was in Isla Mujeres. So thanks both of you. Uh, you really help us keep chugging along. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, so let's... Back, back to the issue at hand. Yeah, so let's move on to potential technique solutions for our situation uh, to, pre had, to have prevented us from dragging. <laughs> wow. Way to be... Uh, Very eloquent. Captain uh, Brevity there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what do we got? Um, okay, so... One, and, and chime in at, at any point here, but uh, some, some, a really important aspect of, you know, how we could have changed our technique, how we are going to change our technique, but what we could have done better to avoid the situation, first of all, is simply realizing, and this is something big that I've learned since this, uh, this experience, is that oftentimes the bottoms the, the bottom the bottom of the sea that you're anchoring in can be so bad that you know your anchor system is going to fail that much easier so uh, let me put this more concisely i have learned to be as concerned with the type of bottom and the quality of the bottom as i am with the conditions yeah because the northerly that came through was strong but like in another bottom we would have been fine yeah exactly so if, if that were, had been sand i mean i wouldn't have worried at all because it, the conditions weren't that bad yeah i mean we were getting sustained winds less than 30 knots gusting over now of course the uh hey 12 bit smith thank you very much nice guys pronunciation on the fly <laughs> well, well what can i say but anyway um but what i'm trying to say is that uh just imagine that you're in a situation where you know for a fact that a storm is going to come through but it's a sand bottom it's a really good bottom you need to bring that into account when you're considering like exactly what your strategy is going to be whereas let's say you've got a small increase in wind and like a, a shifting of the wind direction, but you're in a really bad bottom for holding. Yeah, Project M Manaya <clears throat> says, agree 100%. We came across one island in Myanmar where, where wow. the sand was too fine to hold an anchor. Everyone drags, everyone Whoa. dragged any, always. That's so interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, guy. and do any of you guys have any other stories of like crazy bottoms you've dragged in? Uh, let us know. Got some really bad bottoms out there, man. <laughs> I tell you. But anyway, so so that is a huge lesson that like we learned the hard way, right? And that we we hope that uh, anybody out there that hasn't experienced this can hopefully learn from us. And along that vein, we found since then we when we got to Isla Mujeres, we had read that it was bad holding, but one of the mistakes we made maybe was we didn't really know how bad holding it was. Excuse me, I just burped. <laughs> um, but so ladylike. Yes, I'm very classy. Um, so uh, we learned later that dragging an Isla Mujeres happens to everyone, um, and there are a couple ways to combat that. Um, but it did kind of make us feel better to know that plenty of boats have ended up at Malaga Marina after us, before us, 
and probably will for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, so, uh -huh. Well, I was just going to say, so, and Ken Royal just asked a really good question. Would you advocate using a buoy marker to indicate your anchor location to prevent others from setting on top of you? Um, Ken Royal, That's I would question. say yes, is, but mostly if you're using two anchors with two roads, right? So if you've got an anchor that you're actually uh, lying to, and then you've got another anchor in preparation for a, for a wind shift, um, I would definitely put a buoy on the anchor that you're not lying to. Um, it's not, in my opinion, maybe someone's going to disagree with me, but it's not all that necessary to put a buoy if you only have one anchor out because it's very obvious where that anchor is. And if you think about it like this, like if you have some, if you have a normal amount of scope out, um, for someone to drop their anchor on top of yours, they would pretty much end up exactly where you are, right? So if you're lying to an anchor, it, it, no one's going to uh, drop their anchor on that, unless you have an excessive amount of scope out. Um, but if you have two anchors, yes, a buoy on the second anchor is, is very uh, helpful because if, if you're doing like a 45 degree angle between your anchors, that other anchor is prime territory for someone else to drop the hook. Yeah, and if you guys have experiences with 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 what Jordan's talking about, please let us know. Brian says, the late author of Chapman's Consider the Bible of Boating recommends Bahamian mooring. So that's interesting. Bahamian mooring. Bahamian well, mooring. so, and Bahamian mooring is going to be a more fore and aft configuration, generally for like tidal swings and stuff, like our friend's Venture Lives experience. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, all, all that is a really good point. All right, so let's um, go on to, actually, we find out coincidentally that both uh, White Spot Pirates and MJ Sailing dragged anchor in Isla Mujeres. <laughs> go figure. So we'll go ahead and uh, talk about what happened to Nike on White Spot Pir Pirates. Yeah, oh, Nike. Let's hear it, man. See, another entertaining anecdote. Hey, this is Nika from Anti the Lines, and I have dragged. It's actually quite a funny story or quite a funny coincidence because it happened in Isla Mujeres and it happened when I wasn't on my boat Carl. I came back and I found him sitting on a sandbank next to a massive rock and he was like, mom, mom, help me, I'm stuck here. And when it comes to anchoring, I'd say I'm actually a fairly conservative person. I put at least five times the depth when I put down the chain and um, I back up with my engine 1500 RPM to check if everything is safe. I dive down if I can. I put on a snubber and still, it happened. <laughs> Awkward. Okay, I think we're back. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Caught us off guard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, and, and I love getting to hear her anecdote about that because for people that haven't been to Isla Mujeres, you might, you know, tend to think, oh, well, yeah. You know, like, but you probably could have done something different. But once you come here, man, it's like everybody drags here. It's hilarious. Yeah. I, it's, so, you know. And the lesson we learned is like, when it, once it happened to us, we were so like humbled and mortified that we realized the people who came out and helped us, like that saved our dream essentially. So that oh, changed yeah. our perspective completely about um, just being totally available when other people are dragging, like try to be as helpful as you possibly can. That's so true, man. Like that's the and thing. And don't hate. Come on. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, if that's a preference, I guess. Right. If, the, if someone's dragging, just go and help them. Try not to judge. You know. Yeah. No, that I can say for myself, like because of what other sailors and the cruising community did here to help us, like for the rest of my life, I'm gonna be the first one in the dinghy like shooting out to try and help somebody. You know what I mean? It, it, it had such a profound impact on, on both of us. Um, okay, so now uh, we've got a quick anecdote that we want to share from Sailing Uma, um, uh, specifically about, um, well, I guess, okay, before we go to the their anecdote, the next element, oh, and, and excuse me, the uh, technique solutions, the next technique solution that we really learned uh, that we're going to do differently in the future is when the, the conditions get to a situation, when the conditions get so that you're concerned about the anchor holding, 
stay on the boat. And, and that is probably the number one lesson that we learned from our experience. Um, yeah, we were new to cruising, so we thought checking in to the country was more of a priority, and we didn't want to go into town like it was a wet dinghy ride, but we were trying to be responsible, um, but we realized that was yeah. not the priority at the time. Yeah, <laughs> so since from that point, we've realized like, you know, even if you have some sort of a legal obligation like checking into the country, you can you can wait that out a day or two or three. I mean, your boat is the priority. Period. Other people's boats around you are the priority, and, um, and the bureaucracy is just going to have to wait. Yeah, and they'll um, understand. Yeah, and but the and on top of that, <clears throat> like again, taking into account the condition of the bottom. So sure, if you've got a nice hard sand bottom, not hard, but like a firm sand bottom, um, you, you know that boat's not going anywhere in fairly you know uh adverse conditions but if it's not a good bottom boy once the wind starts to pick up at all we are going to be staying on the boat um you just can't trust it yeah now I, oh go on well we've got two questions do you mind if i move oh, no, 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 okay no. so first thing i'd say is also if you like have to leave the boat for some reason leave your key in the ignition because we were kind of like oh we're in a new country why would we leave the key in the ignition um, but we realized later, if we had left the key in the ignition, um, somebody could have just started up Atticus and reset the anchor, and it wouldn't have been a big deal. But people couldn't figure out how to start Atticus yeah. because we had the key hidden somewhere. Yeah, so yeah, that was another. Leave your key in the ignition. That was another really like hard lesson to learn. Yeah, we, if we had just had the key there, none of this would have happened. Yeah, and then no. also Tom McFarland asks, are you going to keep the current anchor as a backup? Uh, storage space so I think he's referring to our Manson Supreme 25 pounder um, no but that's only because our other anchors that we have on board are more appropriately sized for the boat so that Manson is actually sort of the lightest uh, anchor that's not entirely true we've got a 25 pound CQR 33 pound Bruce Eric, oh, hey, Eric. cheers, buddy. You're awesome. Cheers. Cheers to you. 25-pound um, 20 20 CQR, 33-pound Bruce. And um, so those, those, and then we're hoping to get a fortress here in the near future. We Right now we've got a West Marine-style Danforth. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, I think four anchors is enough for a 30-foot <laughs> boat. And so my choice between the Manson and the CQR would fundamentally be what I would choose between. And because the uh, Mantis and the Manson are so similar in type, I'd rather have a diversity in the type of anchor. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ditch the the Manson so that we'll have a Mantis CQR Bruce, and then like I was saying, uh, you know we're probably gonna try and go for a for a fortress as our utility anchor. Yeah, and the reason we decided to go with the fortress is because. Um, Atticus went, like, like, they let Atticus wash up onto a sandbank, and then we had to get Atticus out of there the next day, and the only anchor that actually worked with Kedging was uh, our neighbor's fortress. I don't remember how. Yeah, it. he had a big fortress, but yeah. man, that that really impressed me. Like, he, yeah. we, we did that bad boy out, dropped it down, and, like, we pulled Atticus off of that sandbar, like, in, in a matter of, you know, no time at all, I'll yeah. just put it that way. Yeah, so that changed our decision like that. Um, yeah. Two questions real quick. Venture Lives asks, how much chain do you guys have? 100? Venture Lives, we have 300 feet of chain. Yes, and then Three, Rob 300 S. 300 feet of quarter-inch high, high test. Rob S., hey, Rob S. says, um, do you guys use an anchor watch system when sleeping at anchor? We do now. Well, and we did at the time, too. Um, we we, we have haven't alarm? had it. Yeah. Okay. We use an app. Um... I can't remember which app it is, but boy, there's a handful of them out there. Um, but you just have it on your phone, and you just you can uh, you can do one of two things. You can right when you drop your anchor, you can set your app and say, okay, the anchor is right here. Mm -hmm. This is the position of the anchor, and then you can tell it what your how much road you have out, and it'll set a radius. Or what you can do is after you've set it and things have calmed down a little bit, you can actually point your phone in the, the same direction as the boat is pointing and then tell it how much road you let out and it will place the anchor for you. You can set a radius 
and then same thing. But there's a handful of different apps out there. A lot of them have like a free version, a paid version, um, and they're they're great. Um, I know um, uh, Venture Lives it was talking about in their video how the their anchor alarm was a lifesaver for them. And yeah. I'd be curious what you guys use. Yeah, what for do you that. guys use? So, you want to get the light set up while I address someone's question? Oh, yeah. Ken Royal says keep your Whoa, keep your right. fenders keep your fenders hanging instead of stored too. And I would say yeah, if you're leaving the boat for an extended period of time for an inshore uh, ashore trip. Um, leave some extra lines out, leave fenders out, um, because ours were easily accessible. If you open our cockpit locker, you, you would have seen all of our lines hanging neatly. Um, but in the chaos, nobody opened that up. So they were using like our uh, halyards and stuff to, to get Atticus all situated. So it was, yeah. it was kind of a cluster mess. <laughs> cluster mm. mess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice so one. let's move on to. Do we already Sailing go into Uma. Sailing Uma's yeah. anecdote? Okay. So do you want to read it? Sure, I'll read oh, it. Oh, Desiree is such a nice voice. I do. All right. So we really do believe that this was. Oh, sorry. Ooh. There you go. Okay. When we anchored in front of Livingston, Guatemala, we anchored the same way we always do. But due to multiple adverse conditions, shallow depth, current wind, we dragged for the first time. A very strong wind gust pushed the boat over the anchor, wrapped the chain around the anchor, and, and caused it to foul. At the very moment, the wind died down a bit, and the current pushed the boat sideways, wrapping the chain around the keel, causing the boat to drag. Oh, uh, and I will say there's a really good, uh, Sailing Uma has an awesome video. I didn't read the second. I know, you were okay. Oh, the Sailing Uma has an amazing video talking about why they dragged and, and what happened exactly. It's super cool. Check yeah. it out. Definitely. Highly um, and so she says, we really do believe that this was not the fault of our anchor and would have happened no matter what anchor we had. A bohemian mooring would have just made, meant two anchors to foul and chain to catch. A stern anchor may have helped, but we had four knot current in, on our bow and 40 knots of wind on the stern. In hindsight, there they may have been many things to do differently, but who knows if anyone, if any of them would have helped. Kika and I left for the first night with our new crew, Sev, to stay and watch. Sev handled it well. The way he saw was the best of the time. It is always easy to play the what if game, and if we were there, maybe we could have done something differently, but the truth is you can't always be prepared for absolutely everything. And that's true. I think, like, again, we wish we would have stayed on the boat knowing that the conditions were going to pick up and knowing that the holding was a little bit um, questionable. Yeah, less than optimal. Yeah. All right, so let's see. And and if you, do you guys do Brian and uh, Martin? Do you guys have anything to say about that? Like, do you think there is a foolproof anchor that prevents dragging one hundred percent of the time? Um, I'd be curious. Yeah. I have to sneeze. <laughs> um, all right. So the other thing we could have the the other thing we could have done specifically for um, Isa Mujeres is consider using two anchors with separate roads uh, when you know the wind is going to be shifting. So, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I was reading a comment. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, so that is definitely one of the techniques that we could have done differently in this specific situation. When you know that, you know, here in East Maharas, we're in the trade wind, so the wind is always more or less coming out of the east, you know, generally speaking. Right before a front comes through, it comes out of the south, right? And then once that front comes through, it comes out of the northwest and then the north. Um, one way you can combat this issue is to have one anchor to the east and one anchor to the north. Now, you're going to have special challenges if you choose this technique because, like I said, with each front that comes through, you're going to do 360 degrees, right? You're going to go from east to south to west, northwest, and then back over to east. So if, if this is some sort of a permanent condition for your boat, if you're going to be sitting out multiple fronts in that same anchorage, you're gonna get those uh, uh, roads totally wrapped up. That's not the end of the world, but much like um, uh, Sailing Uma's example and much like Venture Live's example, when when you have your roads in 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 a, in a situation where you can't simply pull it in 
that limits your options, right? So if, if you've got a stern anchor and a bow anchor out and they're both under load, that, that limits your options. If your bow anchor road is wrapped around your keel and dangerously close to your prop, that limits your options. Same exact thing if you've got two anchors and two rows and they've wrapped around each other, now you've got to do a, a little bit of, you know, anchor hauling gymnastics to get one anchor in or let one anchor out more or whatever the case may be. Um, so ideally, using two anchors with two rows would be in a situation where you know for certain that you'd have wind from one direction switching to the other. So just be really careful if you know you're going to experience that full 360 wind, uh, degree wind change, at least to really keep an eye on those anchors and be prepared to untangle them from time to time. Now, this is something that I don't have a huge amount of experience with. Um, it's something I'm a little bit nervous about doing for long periods of time in the future. I would love to know if any of you guys watching have had experiences dealing with that issue. If you find that using two anchors and two roads is preferable, or if you like using one anchor and one road, sacrificing the redundancy for the fact that you can always adjust that road. Please let us know. Yeah, I'd let love... us know. And also, Martin and Brian, if you want to weigh in on that discussion, please do. Um, yeah. Got two good questions. Um, let's start with Tom McFarland says, can you expand more on Bahamian mooring? Yeah, I can talk about that real, real quick. Um, <clears throat> And I'll, and I'll preface that by saying we're really excited about doing a whole series of videos on anchoring because it is a super popular topic and it's a very uh, in-depth, uh, complicated topic. So I'll, I will talk about it really briefly though. So Bahamian mooring, and we've actually never done a proper Bahamian moor. We've, we've done bow and stern anchor configurations before, specifically in the Florida Keys where you've got that long chain of islands and then as the you know tidal uh, flow happens every single day you've got a current that runs north to south through those islands and um, so a Bahamian moor is generally a good option when you're going to be riding to a current um, in a relatively um, uh, confined space uh, so you know for a fact that three four times a day you're going to be you know bow to the north and then bow to the south or you know, east to west or whatever you're going to be you're going to be oscillating back and forth so a bahamian moor is simply having effectively it's having an anchor in front of you having an anchor behind you but instead of having that be a bow anchor and a stern anchor both those anchors are connected to a swivel or at, you know, at least like just connected at some point and and then the point at which the two roads connect is, is actually below the boat. So the two roads connect to a single road and then that single road goes up to the anchoring platform. So that way as the boat swings, the keel doesn't get fouled on the anchor on the road as you'll see in, uh, in Uma's latest episode. And real quick, um, uh, SV Mystique says, Oh no, Zorn101 says, do you ever use two anchors in series on the same road? And uh, check out Venture Lives' video because they actually go into that. Um, he sa they say, we used to do that with ours. It works well, but I recommend one large oversized anchor. And if you watch their video, you'll see what they mean. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Another question real quick is, uh, uh, Sailing Dijon says, so, so with that much chain aboard, you anchor with all chain all the time? Uh, yes, Sailing Dijon, we, we do. Um, our primary anchor road is chain, um, and that will, the, the high test quarter inch chain has a working load of 2,600 pounds, I believe. So, and, and for our boat, that gets us through just about all, you know, conceivable normal circumstances. If we were to really ride out a true hurricane, um, that's when we would go to um, our, our hurricane road, so to speak, which is um, three quarter inch nylon, three strand line, and then a length of uh, a proof coil chain. Um, and, uh, and that's a whole nother story. But yeah, so we, we have 300 feet of quarter inch chain in, in the bow, um, which is a definite 
sacrifice. But it works out because in the stern, we've got all this like useless space kind of below the, uh, the aft part of the cockpit. And that's where I keep all of my power tools when we're underway. And so that adds up. <laughs> so the, the chain and the power tools balance each other out. I would not- And roller blades. I would not recommend putting a lot of weight in the extremities of your boat. It's not good. <laughs> it's not a good idea. But on a 30-foot boat, you got a lot of stuff, and you got to fit it all on there somehow. So. Yeah, Brian Sheehan from Fortress says, if the anchor breaks uh, while power setting, then good. Better at that time than a middle than in the middle of the night when the boat is unattended. That's a great yeah, point. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and um, this is a cool little tip, and I have no idea how valid it is but i read it somewhere and um i've heard that when you power set your anchor you should go at 50 percent of your total rpms on your engine um so the total on our uh, diesel is 3600 so we power set at 18. and what we'll do especially if we're in like turtle grass or something that like is really hard to set the anchor um, i'll be up on the bow with my foot on the chain so I can feel if it's dragging and I can look over and see if we're dragging. And then I'll be communicating with Desiree who's in the cockpit and we'll start at idle and then we'll increase to like, you know, 1200 and then 1400, 1600 and then 1800. And if we can get to 1800 and we're not dragging, then then we're done and we'll go dive on it. Yeah, anchor. and before we like actually go dive on it, I, I'll put my hand on the chain and kind of feel if it's like vibrating or it feels weird. Um, and eventually doing it enough times, you can almost kind of feel if it's if something's funky. Um, so initially when Jordan was like, feel the chain, can you tell if it's dragging? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but after we did it a couple times, I could kind of tell a little bit. So that's just your intuition, yeah. but always dive on it if yeah. you can. But um, it, it's a vibration. Yeah. You can feel like a vibration in the chain. Speaking of communication while anchoring, let's move on to Trio Travel's um, anecdote, which is um, really interesting. Uh, we haven't perfected our communication, like sign language on board, like all the other cool couples out there. Um, but they have a really good system and check it out. Yeah. And, be and before we go into it, I will say that, um, it, it, from the research I've done and everything else, it's a very like, uh, gentlemanly way of anchoring is to try to not raise your voice. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the British have a tradition it from, from their nautical tradition or the maritime tradition of trying to not ever raise their voice in almost anything that they do. And uh, and I really kind of dig it, right? I like that concept. So we haven't perfected it. We have not perfected it, <laughs> but you can sure learn from Trio Travels because yeah. it sounds like they've- Because they're on it. They've, they've <laughs> and, got it and down. And they're awesome. Check out their channel. They're amazing people. We hung out with them at Isla Mujeres, had, de uh, I was gonna say December with them. Spent the holidays with them Christmas and Halloween. And they're and awesome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here you go. Hey guys, it's Brad and Krista from Trio Travels along with Project Atticus. Thanks for having us on, guys. So we've got a 65-pound <laughs> mattress anchor, and it comes with a 25-foot bridle system. And Chris is going to tell you how we anchor. Okay, so we have dragged once. We were in the south side of Cuba, and it was super grassy. A squall rolled in, and we started to drag, and it couldn't reset, so... The anchor basically filled up with grass, and it wouldn't point back down. It just couldn't clear itself. So we did manage to get it reset after the squall blew us blew over us and there was nothing to drag into so we were good on that time and actually it yeah, happened it was, at daytime which yeah we were it's lucky usually at night that anybody drags western into cuba and the daylight so we were lucky yeah it's usually nighttime so anyway what we try to do is find a grassy patch to drop the hook and once we find one then we put the hook down and slowly back up once we feel it set then i put it into hard reverse at about 1800 rpms or so and once we feel like it's... We pick a spot on land. Yeah, well, we pick a spot on land to make sure that we're not dragging backwards. Each one of us picks a different spot. And then we'll put it into neutral again just to let it settle in. And then try it in hard reverse again. And when we leave anchor, it's a three-man thing on our boat. It doesn't have to be, but we've incorporated all three of us. I've got a set of hand signals that I give to Krista and Cole. So Cole is on the windlass. He's bringing in the chain and making sure it doesn't pile up and bind. And when I give him a hand fist like this, it means stop pulling. And then, of course, this means start again. And then when I ask Krista to go into neutral, I go up high. So she gets all the hand commands up high. And I go like this, which means go neutral. 
and then she'll go neutral and then I'll tell Cole to start again. And then when we're all finished and the anchor's up and clear, I'll give Chris a nice high peace sign, which means we're good to go. And I have control. And you have control. So that's pretty much how we do it. Works for us and hopefully it'll work for you guys too. All right. Good luck out there. Cheers. This Cole says tree out. See ya Desiree and Jordan. Nice. Oh, they're, they're awesome guys. If you haven't checked out their channel, they're great. We're considering at some point in the future, maybe having a boat baby, doing like a boat family. And if you're even interested in that, True Travel is a great channel to kind of see a, yeah. a family underway. Cole's the coolest kid. He is a cool kid. And I'm obsessed with Krista. Yeah. Brad, you're pretty awesome too, but girl yeah. power, man. You guys should you guys should ask them, like go onto their Facebook and ask them for pictures of Cole in his uh, mm. Halloween costume. Yeah. He was a he was a big deal here in East Mahara. Mm -hmm. He was. <laughs> <laughs> Local celebrity. Yeah. All right, do you want to go into MJ Sailing's quick anecdote? Yeah, okay, so and then we'll do one more. This is our last uh, uh a collaborative anecdote but man this has been fun so I'll, I'll, I'll read through this one this is from MJ sailing uh, uh oh hold on there we go um, okay we'll start here so MJ sailing said we did have an anchor dragging experience once before with our last boat serendipity we were in the main harbor of Isla Mujeres Mexico when a bad storm came rolling through We'd been there a while and knew the area, so normally with a little warning of an upcoming storm, we would move ourselves into the small lagoon where there is thick mud and good holding. In this one instance, we stayed outside in the main harbor. We'd never had problems up to that point with our 55-pound rockna, but when the storm came through that night, it was strong, sustained winds in the mid-40s. We looked out the companionway. It was night at this time, of course and saw that the anchor light of the boat behind us was getting much brighter. <laughs> Running outside, we could see we were in fact dragging closer to it. I turned the engine on and immediately started moving us forward while Matt brought the anchor up. When he got it out of the water, it was tangled in a BMX bike frame. No wonder our ground tackle didn't hold. Getting it off, we motored through the rain and dark to a spot closer to the main channel and dropped once more. We've never had a problem since then, with the new boat, we have a Mantis 25 kilo anchor. So far, so good. Um, oh gosh, sorry. Okay, there we go. So that just goes to show, like, no matter what you prepare for, who knows what's going to happen, what's going to be down there. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing. There's no foolproof anchoring system. You just got to try really hard and like learn yeah. from your mistakes, like yeah. everything. Yeah, this concept that you could somehow design an anchoring system where you won't drag is just unrealistic and it's an oversimplification of the issue um now the other thing that i want to say about that anecdote first of all mj sailing awesome channel check them out they've been around for a long time they've been doing this for a while um but uh in east Mujeres, the harbor that they dragged in our boat right now is at a dock that overlooks that harbor and boy like every single like major squall that comes through or major like norther that comes through especially the squalls like in the summer you get a real bad squall that comes through there's no necessary there's no like multiple day warning for that and i'd say when you get a bad squall like we'll just kind of like poke our heads out at night to see how it's going and there's like there's been times where like 50 percent of the boats out at anchor are actively underway mm -hmm. dealing with anchors that have that have failed and that are dragging yeah 50 percent of the entire anchorage yeah, i mean it's not un, unusual there's one situation where it was after we had dragged there's a big uh storm system that came through and we were like let's go out in our dinghy and help people and actually it was unsafe on our dinghy because like we were taking we weren't taking on water but it was so rough that we actually couldn't get out to the anchorage so we were like well we'll just like stand by around here and yeah. see if we can help <laughs> yeah, that got that got we literally were in the dinghy yeah. we were like, <laughs> on our way no. and we probably were in the thing for like 30 seconds and then a gust yeah. came and we're like okay yeah. let's go back. and like had we showed up we probably would have been like oh how can we help and they would have been like get out of here right. like, we're we, trying to handle things <laughs> we were more gung-ho than we were useful yeah. probably but our heart was there yeah our heart was there. so <laughs> G social, I love this comment, uh, referring to using hand signals as opposed to, you know, yelling. 
He says, the hand signals I give usually end with me sleeping alone that night. <laughs> That's awesome, she's yeah. social. That's great. I hear you, man. No, don't even begin to think that that we don't get in, like, massive, like, yeah. like ground-shaking arguments yeah. when we're trying yeah. to... And right now, guys, we've gotten through all of our questions that we were planning to go through, so this is just open forum. If you guys have any questions, comments that we didn't get to, please feel free to like shoot them out at us. Um, and I actually wanted to talk about our anchoring system, our anchoring anecdote, my first anchoring anecdote where we got in a huge argument. <laughs> oh. Do you remember? When when you went in the water? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to tell it or should I? I'll tell it. So, and feel free to ask questions and comments as we go because this is just a funny little anecdote. And about anything. If you guys yeah. have any questions regarding <laughs> anchoring or anything, Bring them at us, and we'll and we'll start tackling. Oh, and real quick, um, somebody's asking, "Where are you?" And we are actually in Isla Mujeres still, um, and we've been trying to pay for data to do the live streams from our boat, but Telcel has been crazy, so we had to um, do it in a friend's uh, like hotel room. <laughs> so we're at a we're at a dock that has a hotel, and we're in the manager's cousin's room. Yeah. <laughs> So, anyways, those well, are the security cameras behind us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so sorry about the corporate uh, sort of Feel, vibe. Yeah. yeah, we swear we're cruising. <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, John Ar Archard asks where are you headed next? We're heading to the south coast of Cuba. And we, an easy way to put it, we're going to spend the next year cruising east along the south coast of the Greater Antilles. Probably spend the early part of the summer mm -hmm. heading south on the Lesser Antilles, and then hopefully spend the uh, the major, you know, the core of hurricane season on the north coast of South America, heading west towards Panama, um, so that we can stage for a Panama Canal transit in uh, the beginning of next year, and then be prepared for a Pacific crossing next year. And uh, Waka Irie, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, says, do you have a secondary anchor on the bow? No, not on the bow. Um, and that's a uh, function of the fact that the boat is relatively small, and we've already got a lot of weight forward um, with the all-chain road and then the, the oversized anchor that we're going to have shortly. Um, there, that's a lot of weight forward, and I'm and having another anchor and road ready to go on the bow would be super awesome. Mm -hmm. But we just can't justify the extra weight right now. Um, so we store our uh, uh, alternative anchors and roads uh, in the cockpit lockers, which on our boat extend fairly far forward because it's such a small boat. And, and it's very low in the boat as well. So. Cool. Uh, two questions. Uh, when are we leaving Mexico? Uh, for David Rump at, Rupp asks. Um, and our plan is to leave here in the next, like within the month. We're paid up through March 17th. Um, and we've been paying our anchor or our dock fees through um, like a bartering of work. So I've been doing a lot of sewing work and Jordan's been doing a lot of boat maintenance work and he actually painted the dock and does their electrical like uh, ins and outs. So we'd really like to get out of here by March 17th. We have we'd to- We'd like to get out of here tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just not gonna happen. Yeah, we were ambitious and decided to build a hard dodger. So Jordan's in the middle of that project and then I've got to make the canvas installation to it. Um, we also have all the parts for a water maker um, that we're going to make from scratch. Um, but we're trying to decide if we should stay in Isla Mujeres to, to make that water maker system um, because we have an excellent setup here. The marina loves us. We've got all. Yeah. <laughs> we've got. We've loves got. Loves her. <laughs> okay. We've got good amenities, good friends here. It's easy to do work. Um, or if we should just get out of here and make the water maker when we make the water maker because Atticus has been sedentary for almost a year now and we do miss moving and we're feeling really anxious and antsy. So uh, we're trying to decide what to do. This is a great question. Uh, dude, dude, Nat, I want to answer that, but real quick. Eric Rodden mm -hmm. is, is bringing up a question he mentioned in the last live stream, so mm -hmm. we really should mention it. Do you have a low voltage disconnect in line to protect the batteries? No, we don't. Um, we do have a battery monitor, 
Um, right now we've got a battery charger hooked up to our shore power, but normally that's also being charged by the solar panels and the wind generator. So the, the, the quick answer is no, we don't. Um, because we live on the boat, it's not as big of a deal because I'm constantly checking the batteries. Um, so it, it's the kind of thing, if you were to leave a boat alone for a while, that would definitely be a really good idea. But thanks for the question, Eric, and sorry for not getting to it last week. Yeah, and John Archer says, I keep my second anchor in the cockpit and in the cockpit sail locker ready to deploy if needed. That's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Zorn says, why don't people sail down to Chile? And we actually considered it. Well, <laughs> people do, but they generally... The reason they don't sail down to Chile on the west coast of the Americas is because you're going against the current and the wind all the way from the equator, like down through like the horse latitudes, I believe. Um, and uh, so the point is, the point is that you, you you'd be going against wind and current for a long ways there. The trade winds coming across the Pacific like force water to head east along the equator, and then that water. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the opposite way. It forces water to head west along the equator, and then that water ultimately does like a big loop that circles all the way back up to the, the poles, and then uh, in the northern hemisphere it heads south, and in the southern hemisphere it heads north and meets uh, around you know Ecuador again, and then, and then funnels back uh, along the equator. So the point is, is if you want to go to Chile, the way most people do it is by heading like over to the uh, Canaries and then the uh, the Verde Islands off of Africa, and then sailing from there all the way down to South America, like Brazil, and then you can coastal hop. Or you've got to do like a Southern Ocean passage from Australia or South Africa, um, doing coastal hops, heading south on the west coast of the Americas is, is pretty hard in the southern So area. I got a good question. Dudenator yes. says, I saw the video where you left Florida with $2,000 in your cruising kitty. Weren't you nervous about running out of money? And yes, we were yes. Like, terrified. But welcome to our life. Yeah. Like, we've been super nervous about money for a long time. <laughs> but we're just that stupid that we just go for it. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. The chances I'm, of failure for us this whole time have been relatively high, I guess. But we, I think it, there is a little bit of stupidity. And there's a little bit of, like, just... Have you ever heard the, the, that concept that, like, really imagine the worst-case scenario for whatever endeavor you're considering? And really think about, like, the worst thing. Um, and, and when you do that, you really start to realize, I think, like... How, how manageable that would be if it were to occur. You know yeah. what I mean? So that's kind of been Worst our... Worst case scenario, we could have run our credit really through the roof. And then had to get real jobs again. Yeah, or yeah. even like flying back to the States. And, you know, we left really good relations with the two yachts that we were uh, crewing on in Key West. So, and then we both used to work on super yachts. So they're always emailing us, trying to get us to come work on their boats. Um, so we, we did have plan B, um, but we wanted to get out there and try to make it work and we were so nervous we were it was ridiculous like once we got to Isla Mujeres and dragged it was actually a blessing in disguise that it kind of threw us back into the uh, kind of like working market so we met Captain John from Second Star and he's actually been working from his boat full time for the last seven years and making enough money to keep cruising um, so he kind of showed us the ropes and we're actually going to release a video uh, in two weeks about um, working while you sail and the best ways to do it and kind of lessons learned because we learned, again, the hard way, some mistakes that we made, so. Yeah, and Venture Live, oh, thanks for that comment. They said, you just gotta go for it, no stupidity. If you wanna do it, you'll find a way to make it work. And, and I agree with that. And that makes me think of uh, Bernard Matissier's statement when he was doing like a seminar and uh, and someone asked him how much does it cost to cruise and this was a long time ago like I shouldn't say long from a cruising standpoint it was early in like the the like culture of cruising's history um, Bernard Matissier said it costs everything that you have 
Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's so perfect. Like, yeah. that's exactly how much it costs. Is there, I don't and more. <laughs> I don't know anyone that effectively cruises and they're like, oh. yeah, I only like spend a portion of what I have. Yeah. Like, it's just like this full commitment sort of sort of deal. Yeah. Okay. Cool question. Mark Bowers asks, water maker electric or propelled from the engine? I think. What? Uh, is your water maker electric or propelled from the oh, engine? Oh yeah. So Mark, yeah, our water maker will be engine driven. Um, and that was a choice that I made because on Atticus, we don't have a generator, uh, and our ability to generate electricity is fairly, uh, you know, it's, it's humble. I'll say that like we've got 200 Watts of solar and this is like the semi flexible solar panel panels that are made in China. So I'm actually not entirely, I don't want to, you know, beat on China too much. I like a lot of the stuff they make, but but I don't think these solar panels are really ever capable of producing that much wattage. Yeah, but, we, were, um, we were hoping for Solbian, but Scotia out of our price range. Thanks, bro. We really oh, appreciate thank it, you. buddy. That's awesome. But uh, but anyway, so the and then we got the the wind generator. The, the, what I'm trying to say though is that we don't have much of a capacity to generate a lot of electricity. Um, and so, uh, and so, like the our main, if we were to use an electrical, uh, an electrically powered water maker, it we would be running it off of the alternator, you know, which is powered by the the diesel engine, and that power conversion, whether you go through an alternator into your battery system and then to your high pressure pump you're losing a lot of energy through all of those transfers. So if you can actually just power your high pressure pump through your, your main engine, you're, you're, you're suffering a much lower energy cost at that point. Um, and so it's, it's more of a pain, but for us, you know, like the boat is just is not designed to have a lot of electricity at any given moment. So, so Mike Beal asks, do you guys think you'll be able to travel for a while before stopping to work again? And I'll say that we were lucky enough to get a lot of work in Isla Mujeres, um, and we've saved up enough to be able to cruise um, without Patreon and everything for what was it five months? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Do you think you will be able to travel for a while before stopping to work? Oh, I, I see the the question. Yeah. So at our current at our current level on Patreon right now, and with our I'm saying without Patreon, I think we can. Oh, without produce, Patreon whatsoever. Yeah. Oh, we could probably we could probably go for four four to five months, yeah. something like that. And so what our big goal is right now is to try to transition from doing like a lot of maintenance work on other people's boat to focusing full time on Patreon. So that's kind of like our 500 challenge, um, which is we'd like to be uh, making $500 per episode on Patreon so that we can stop working for other people and kind of work for our viewers. And it's not that we don't enjoy the work, it's just that like we're way more passionate about kind of sharing our story um, than like, you know, doing odd jobs and it's it's actually very difficult we don't really have a like a studio or anything so every time i do a selling jo a sewing job for example even though i only charge one hour for a repair it takes me like three hours maybe four to go meet them uh figure out what they need figure out if i have the supplies i need sew it up for them and then return the job to them so um, yeah, we'd like to be able to... It's just a time thing. Yeah. It's just simply a time thing. Yeah. It really is. It's just, we've only got so many hours in the day, and can we can we make videos all day, or can we can we work on people's boats all day? So, yeah, yeah no, that, don't, yeah, that that is simply, the whole Patreon thing is if you're enjoying the videos, and, and, and you really want us to be able to commit full-time to it, that's what Patreon's about. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, bud, but, um... There was, who was it that was saying? Ken Royal said, guys, time for a toast. Yeah. So uh -oh. cheers, everybody. Cheers. I don't know if you guys are drinking beer or wine or hard liquor or whatever. Cheers. Here's, cheers. Uh, here's to an enjoyable evening talking about boats and anchoring and, and to get to hear a lot of awesome anecdotes from yeah. other sailing vlogs. It was great. So cheers. Awesome. Okay, Sailing Dijon asks, about ready to buy a Rockna 15K, 33 pounds for our... Uh, e 35 foot 12,000 pound boat. What are your thoughts on Rockna? 
Um, I think that the the this new design of anchor that Manson, Rockna, and Mantis are all sort of you know going after the roll bar is a is a really wonderful design absolutely wonderful we are going with uh mantis as our next you might want to plug this in if you, if you got the cable oh, okay. um we're going to be going with mantis now the reason that we're going with mantis is because what's this oh. somebody asked what you're drinking <laughs> oh i'm drinking soul yeah the cheapest the, beer in Mac well no Tecate is the cheapest but it's not the Soul's cheapest like our middle ground. It's yeah. cheap enough, but doesn't taste it's like water. Ch it's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap and good. Um, but uh, so we're going with Mantis, and and I actually feel very passionately about this choice because, and I don't know if any of you guys out there have been in this situation, but if you decide to go with high test chain as opposed to proof coil or triple B, um, if you decide to go with high test chain and you also want a swivel between the anchor and your chain, there hasn't been an option until recently that doesn't make the swivel the weak link in that entire system, right? So, and just to go into a really brief description of this, high test chain has a really high working load for its size. Up until recently, all swivels have been designed so that it will accept a certain size of chain and have a working load designed as though that chain were either proof coil or triple B. If you have high test chain, those older swivels don't work because they're all just normal galvanized steel and they're just and they're not designed for the type of working load that high test has. And I remember when I first decided to go with high test, you know, I was talking to the guy, the people at at West Marine about it, and I'd be like, so you're telling me that you'll sell me high test chain, but you have no options for a way to connect a swivel between the chain and the anchor without fundamentally reducing that high working load of that chain, right? Because the strength of a chain is its weakest link. And then I found Mantis's uh, uh, high test swivel, and it's specifically designed to have that really high working load that high test chain has as far as I've seen, and maybe some of you guys could, uh, um, you know, correct me on this, but as far as I've seen, that's the only... Whoa. <laughs> hey, Scotia Gull. Oh, man. That's great. Cheers. Thank you. That's Cheers, so dude. awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate wow. that, man. That is great. Don't to cry. <laughs> um, don't cry. Okay. Don't cry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can go, oh, whatever. Okay, okay. But, um, Keep it together. <laughs> wow. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate That's that. That's really awesome. Uh, but so just to, just to like, you know, finish that thought. So like Mantis, in, okay, so here's where I'm at with this, right? Like <laughs> what I was saying before is that cruisers are a fraction of the boating market. And it's hard as a fraction of any market to have like a voice loud enough to like get the manufacturers to pay attention to you and to start being responsive to your needs. Mantis is doing that. Mantis is being responsive to the needs of cruisers. And I think that that's like not only really forward looking, but like innovative and like they're, and they're just, in, in my opinion, they're trying to carve out the cruising niche for themselves. So I'm a big fan. Yeah. Big fan. Yeah, we're really happy and they're very responsive. For me, if I can call a company and talk to someone in person, like I'm almost sold. And that's true for Mantis and I'm, if you know me, you will know I'm like obsessed with Sailrite. Um monitor wind vane as well. Like I yeah, they're they're great and very responsive to cruisers in particular. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, if you guys have enjoyed tonight's live stream uh, and don't want to miss another one, uh, go ahead and text Atticus to 43506 and we'll send you a text notification uh, when we're going live. Um, and also thanks to Text Signal for providing this service. You guys are awesome. And if you guys are looking to uh, increase your engagement on your own live streams, check them out. They're amazing. Um, all right. Uh, also, if you've enjoyed tonight's live stream, uh, please give us a thumbs up. Uh, it really helps us out a lot. Um, thanks, Dave, for being our moderator. You're amazing. I can't even, words don't describe how awesome you are. Um, and finally, thanks uh, to all of the sailing channels that contributed tonight. Oh, and obviously, 
Um, Scotia Gal Scotia is Scotia Gal is Anne. So it's not Anne Aberdeen, no. What? Well, I'm not. I don't no, think so. No, but it's Anne signed on the. No, but it's a different. Another Anne. Anne, thank you. Thank you. That's really Seriously. awesome. Seriously, I am gonna cry when we turn the webcam. Like this, like, <laughs> and, and we tell this to our patrons, people that, that donate in this method. Like, you guys are literally changing our lives, and it's not for no reason. Like, we are super passionate about bringing information, experience videos entertainment to you guys and to have that reciprocated is like this incredible feeling and you, like again you guys are changing our lives yeah so we really appreciate it um and if just to go into that for, again if you guys become patrons we've got this really cool sort of just thing that we've got going on on facebook we've got a patron hangout where we kind of go into detail about the decisions uh the decision process the choices that we're making on everything from um, we just recently had a conversation on how do we respond to negative comments. We yeah. wanted to make a strategy going into the future for responding to you know negative comments and how should we do it. And instead of just coming up with it ourselves, we wanted to kind of go forward to the patron community and talk to them about it. So if you're, if you're not only interested in supporting us, but also sort of having that deeper involvement, Definitely go over to patreon.com slash project Atticus just to check it out. Got a cool video over there for you guys. Yeah, and Scotia Gal says, really amazing to see all the channels that showed up for you. And that was what I was going to talk about next. Thanks to all the collaborators tonight. We've got Trio Travel, Zingaro. Oh. <laughs> Sailing Gosh, Uma, who's in charge of Twice the technical? Pirates, Adventure Lives, MJ Sailing, Follow the Boat, and Mantis Marine, as well as Fortress uh, signed in tonight. So thank you guys so much. Um, and as viewers, if you guys have uh, enjoyed tonight's live stream and this kind of like new collaborative approach, uh, let us know once we post the video live and um, feel free to propose um, topics that we can cover in the future that you're interested in hearing about because Absolutely. this is our jam. We're super passionate about it. Um, and I have goosebumps right now. So yeah, we want to provide information and videos that you want to see. So let us know in the comments uh, once this video is published. Absolutely. And, and you know what, guys, also, because we're hoping to do more of this collaboration in the future. Um, I mean, all of this is new ground, right? Like YouTube, entertainment through YouTube, and like education through YouTube. All of this is totally new. And what we're starting to realize, and some of the other sailing channels are starting to realize, is that we, you know, it, it'd be good to start working together more and more. Um, not only that, so that you guys can get more, you know, bang for your buck, so to speak. You get to have several of the channels you're interested in, you know, all in one place. Um, but but also so that we can just sort of like work together and feed off of each other. So if you guys are interested, like Desiree had said in any specific channels you want us to work with yeah, let's let go. us know also let the other channels that you like know how much you enjoyed this experience tonight yeah they um, can reach out to us and we can make it happen yeah and and, and also it will it will let them realize like wow like people are interested in this so definitely be vocal about that if that was fun for you guys tonight yeah cool all right guys thanks for joining us and we will catch you hopefully either this monday or the following monday if you want to figure out for sure check out our facebook group and we will talk to you then all right guys, Take care, guys. Ugh, so much fun that was really fun have a great week take guys. care